Many believe driving is an activity solely reserved for those who can see. A blind person driving a vehicle safely and independently was thought to be an impossible task. Until now. Hello, my name is Dennis Hong, and we're bringing freedom and independence to the blind by building a vehicle for the visually impaired. So before I talk about this car for the blind, let me briefly tell you about another project I worked on called the DARPA Urban Challenge. Now, this was about building a robotic car that can drive itself. You press start, nobody touches anything, and it can reach its destination fully autonomously. So in 2007, our team won half a million dollars by placing third place in this competition. So about that time, the National Federation of the Blind, or NFB, challenged the research community about who can develop a car that a blind person drive safely and independently. We decided to give it a try because we thought, hey, how hard could it be? We just have already an autonomous vehicle. We just put a blind person in it, and we're done, right? <laughs> <laughs> we could have been more wrong. What NFB wanted was not a vehicle that can drive a blind person around, but a vehicle where a blind person can make active decisions and drive. So we had to throw everything out the window and start from scratch. So to test this crazy idea, uh, we developed a small dune buggy prototype vehicle to test the uh, feasibility. And in the summer of 2009, we invited dozens of blind youth from all over the country and give them a chance to uh, give it for a spin. It was an absolutely amazing experience. But the problem of this car was it was designed to only be driven in a very controlled environment, in a flat, closed up parking lot, even the lanes defined by red traffic cones. So with this success, we decided to take the next big step, to develop a real car that can be driven on the real roads. So how does it work? Well, it's a rather complex system, but let me try to explain it, make it simplified. So we have three steps. We have perception, computation, and non-visual interfaces. Now, obviously, the driver cannot see, so the system needs to perceive the environment and gather information for the driver. For that, we use an inertial measurement unit, so it measures acceleration, angular acceleration, like a human ear, inner ear. We fuse that information with a GPS unit to get an estimate of the location of the car. We also use two cameras to detect the lanes of the road, and we also use three laser range finders. The lasers scan uh, the environment to detect obstacles, car approaching from the front, the back, and also any obstacles that run into the roads, any obstacles around the vehicle. So all this vast amount of information is then fed into the computer, and the computer can do two things. One is, first of all, process this uh, information to have an understanding of the environment. These are the lanes of the road, there's an obstacles, and convey this information to the driver. The system is also smart enough to figure out the safest way to operate the car. So we can also generate instructions of how to operate the controls of the vehicle. But the problem is this. How do we convey this information and instructions to a person who cannot see fast enough and accurate enough so he can drive? So for this, we developed many different types of non-visual user interface technologies. So starting from a three-dimensional pinging sound system, a vibrating vest, a uh, click wheel with voice commands, a uh, leg strip, even a shoe that uh, applies pressure to the foot. But today we're going to talk about three of these non-visual user interfaces. Now, the first interface is called a drive grip. So these are a pair of gloves that has vibrating elements on the knuckle part, so it can convey instructions about how to steer, uh, the direction and the intensity. Another device is called speed strip. So this is a chair, as a matter of fact, it's actually a massage chair. We got it out and we rearrange these uh, vibrating elements in different patterns and we actuate them to convey information about the speed and also instructions on how to use the gas and the brake pedal. So over here you can see how the computer understands the environment. And because you cannot see the vibration, we actually put red LEDs on the drive grip so you can actually see what's happening. This is the sensory data and that data is transferred to the uh, devices through the computer. So these two devices, drive grip and speed strip, are very effective, but the problem is these are instructional cue devices. So this is not really freedom, right? The computer tells you how to drive, turn left, turn right, speed up, stop. We call this the backseat driver problem, right? So we're moving away from these instructional cue devices, and we're now focusing more on the informational devices. A good example for this informational non-visual user interface is called AirPix. So think of it as a monitor for the blind. So it's a small tablet, has many holes in it, and compressed air comes out. 
so it can actually draw images. So even though you're blind, you put your hand over it, you can see the lanes of the road and obstacles. Uh, it's actually, it can also change the frequency of the air coming out and possibly the temperature. So it's actually a multi-dimensional user interface. So here you can see the left camera and the right camera from the vehicle and how the computer interprets that and sends that information to the air picks. For this, we're showing a, a simulator, a blind person driving using the Aeropix. Uh, the simulator was also very useful for training the blind drivers and also quickly testing different type of ideas for different type of non-visual user interfaces. So basically, that's how it works. So just a month ago, in January 29th, uh, we unveiled this vehicle for the very first time to the public at the world-famous Daytona International Speedway during the Rolex 24 racing event. We also had some surprises. Let's take a look. Mark's gonna give me a ride back to the hotel, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, since we started this project, we've been getting hundreds of letters, emails, phone calls from people from all around the world. Letters thanking us, but sometimes you also get funny letters like this one. Now I understand that where there's Braille on a drive of ATM machine, right? <laughs> But sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes I also do get, you know, I wouldn't call it hate mail, but uh, letters of really strong concerns. Dr. Hong, are you insane? Trying to put blind people on the road? You must be out of your mind. Right. But this vehicle is a prototype vehicle, and it's not going to be on the road until it's proven safe as or safer than today's vehicle, and I truly believe this can be happened. But still, with the society, would they accept such a radical idea? How are we going to handle insurance? How are we going to uh, issue a driver license? There's many of these kind of different hurdles besides technology challenges that we need to address before this becomes a reality. Of course, the main goal of this project is to develop a car for the blind, but potentially more important than this is the, the tremendous value of the spin-off technology that can, can come from this project. Uh, the sensors that we use can see through the dark, the fog, and rain. And together with these new, uh, new type of interfaces, we can use these technologies and apply to safer cars for sighted people. Or for the blind, everyday home appliances in the educational setting, in the office setting. Just imagine in a classroom, a teacher writes on the blackboard and a blind student can see what's written and read using these non-visual interfaces. This is priceless. So today, the things I've shown you today is just the beginning. Thank you very much. <laughs>